do you think Beetlejuice is going to go supernova? Or is I that... really hope so. <laughs> You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello everyone, you're listening to The Cosmic Cast. And at the table today, it's me, Marissa Lowe. Across the table, it's the steaming hot cup of Earl Grey, John Pernay Fisher. Hello. To my right, the perfect cup of Lapsang Souchong, Tom Harvey. Hello. And our guest today is the perfectly proportioned baby Chino, Helen Grant. Hello. Hello, Helen. So you've started your PhD here in Manchester about six months ago, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit about what you're working on? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm working with Roman Tartes and Rianne Jones, looking for water and volatiles in ordinary chondrites. But you're quite new to the world of planetary sciences. Yes, I actually know nothing about rocks. Because you were an <laughs> astrophysicist beforehand? Uh, yeah, so um, I did my undergrad and my master's in astrophysics. I first started with galaxies and then I got smaller. Mm-hmm. Uh, I then went to red giants and now I'm shrinking down to asteroids. And I'm thinking maybe for a postdoc, do like particle physics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? Uh, so what? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that, just to clarify. <laughs> so what drew you to planetary science? Um, I always was more interested in planetary science, but I didn't actually know it existed. And so I thought I liked astrophysics, but it turns out that I like planets and asteroids, not stars and galaxies. Yeah, I think because planetary science, it's not the most well-established subject. A lot of people go, oh, space is cool. I I like astronomy. And then they realize, oh, there's other bits Mm -hmm. of uh, the solar system and so on that you can study instead, not necessarily just the physics behind it. Yeah, there was no planetary science at my university where I did my undergrad. Mm. Um, so you did your undergrad in Amsterdam, I believe. Yes, that's correct. So yeah. that's quite unusual. How did how did that come about? So I went on holiday there and there were loads of people in ripped up suits doing shots off of the street. And I was interested in why they were doing that. And it was fresh as week at the university. So I went home and Googled Amsterdam University and applied. Fair <laughs> Uh, so during your freshers week in Amsterdam, did you end up putting on a suit doing shots in the street? No. So it turns out that was actually the fraternity boys and the regular students don't do that. <laughs> oh, that's, were well, you just Turns out they weren't very like friendly people, the frat boys, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it was actually a very different experience to going to university in England because people there drink because they like the taste of beer, not to get really, really drunk. So I remember in my freshers week, I'd see people from the English universities who'd like blackout drunk every night. And then I was there in Amsterdam and we'd like cycle to this nice pub and it was all very calm, really. Like maybe we'd go to a club or something, but, um, and I'd be like, wow, it's very different here. Mm. But it was nicer, I think, because it meant I actually remembered the people that I spoke to the night before. (laughs) Uh, So I'm guessing your course was all taught in English then? Yeah, so I actually went to a really small university. It was only 300 people a year, and it's called Amsterdam University College. So there's two big universities in Amsterdam. There's the Université von Amsterdam, and there's the Rye University. And basically, if you imagine, their two international departments basically just combined and made one international university so people so I could do courses at their universities and people from their university could come to mine if they wanted to get honours um so everything was in English it was about 50% Dutch people and 50% people from just the rest of the world yeah it's really nice mm. and it was cheap as hell <laughs> um but you got to do a lot of cool things during your physics course there yeah so I actually did a six-month a study abroad program to the University of Cape Town and there so actually while my doing my undergrad I did both um, like molecular biology and astrophysics because I wasn't sure which one I preferred um, and so I did the same while I was in South Africa and that was where I kind of realized that I was more interested in the physics side of it than the biology side of mm-hmm. like astrobiology or things like that so then I got to go to um, the South African Astronomical Observatory to do some observations there for a few nights. Um, I was working with Rene Crancourtevet and we were looking for 
galaxies within the zone of avoidance. So if you imagine the Milky Way, we're um, you know about two thirds of the way out and then the center of the galaxy has loads of dust and light pollution so you can't really see well through it and it's called the zone of avoidance. But they'd recently upgraded one of their spectrographs on the telescope out there. And so you could actually see through the center and so we looked at, I think it was 208 galaxies within the local universe, which is actually not very local, obviously, because they're <laughs> galaxies, but we call it the local universe. <laughs> and um, and yeah, so it was basically just looking at these. These were the first time they'd ever been observed. Mm -hmm. So then I ended up writing my bachelor's thesis on that just going through that, reducing all of the data and getting some preliminary information about them, like the type of galaxy they are, mm. their distance, um, an estimate for their age, maybe, things mm. like that. So so how do you do that then? Is that just all spectra you're interpreting, basically? Yes. Yeah, it was... I actually can't remember what wavelength it was. But yeah, it's just you get um, a galaxy spectrum and then different types of galaxies will have different shaped spectra. Mm -hmm depending on their composition, I guess. Mm. On that and then you can also pick out specific elements to calculate the redshift mm. of the galaxy. That's really cool. So how did that lead into your master's project, sticking with the astrophysics theme? Uh, it didn't. I actually finished university and went and worked in a biotech company instead. But then I realized that I hated working and I came back to do a master's here in England. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't really have a plan on what I wanted to do for my master's. It was a master's by research. So I just walked around and spoke to different people. And I like to do sort of observational science instead of theoretical. And so that's when I met Albert Zalstra, who basically turned around and was like, great, I've got a whopping load of data that someone needs to look at. Do mm -hmm. you want to do that? Um, Very nice. So uh, what kind of data was this? This was uh, VLT data taken a few years ago using Vizier, which is a imager and spectrograph. And it was mid-infrared spectra of a group of nearby red giants. So there were in total about 180 of them. And what I did with that, I had to, again, like reduce all of the data throw it through. Actually, that was easier because... ESO have a pre-built pipeline so you can kind of just throw it in and it does it for you except that it didn't work and so I had to build my own pipeline as well after that to fix it and then um, because there was so many of them I could do sort of some statistical analyses of what kind of features were prominent in different types of red giants. And I also modeled them to calculate their mass loss rates. So I found that generally as, as a red giant moves along the asymptotic giant branch, it's reaching the end of its life. It increases in luminosity and decreases in pre uh, temperature. And then as this happens, the dust shells can start to build and then it increases in the mass loss rate of the star. And this is something that hasn't been properly looked at since the 80s. So the data from back then is kind of rubbish. And so okay. this was to try and improve the quality of the data that we have so far. Okay, so uh, going back a couple of steps, what is a dust, what is a dust shell around a star? So you have a star, a red giant, which is red and it's giant. <laughs> <laughs> they named that well didn't they i know smart um so you have a red giant and then you have an extended envelope around it and as you go further out in the extended envelope you can have um molecules can start to coagulate and form dust grains like really fine dust grains so this only really happens in three places in the universe around red giants in dense molecular clouds and in supernovae, I think it is. Okay. Um, so this is where you get like dust that will then when the star dies, it's shot into the interstellar medium. Okay. And then is used for other things. Okay, so what sort of elements is in is this dust made out of? 
Um, so the ones, the I was mostly looking for like silicate dust grains, but you can get anything up to like, you know, enormous organic compounds. Like it really varies. You get some alumina is like an aluminium oxide. So I guess these are all the sort of types of planetary dust, or well, well, solar dust grains that we see and collect here. Well, and meteorites aren't yeah they really? so these dust grains will go on eventually to form meteorites yeah so i guess it does the master's project feeds in better to what i'm doing now mm. so with this dust shell then presumably that decreases the luminosity of stars it's the intrinsic luminosity right. of the star not the actual like yeah but from our observation dust, i guess the dust I mean. will only block out certain wavelengths of light so the longer the wavelength of light, the less it's affected by the dust particles because, so for example, blue light and visible light, it's really hard to see a red giant because the wavelength is rough, roughly the same as the radius or diameter of these dust grains. Mm-hmm. But as you get to longer wavelengths, it can kind of fly through without really hitting the grains. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's why you can observe these kind of stars. Is um this may be a silly question? Is this what Beetlejuice is then? Is that a red giant? That's a red giant, stuff is... yeah. But that is a later type, and I think it's maybe also a large, a high mass red right. giant. I'm not entirely sure about that. But I was looking at low to intermediate, so that's sort of 0.5 to 8 solar masses, and I have a feeling Beetlejuice is more massive than that. Is that right? You look like you're nodding. Yeah, I think so. So having, <laughs> having an expert view on this then, do you think Beetlejuice is going to go supernova? Or is I that... really hope so. <laughs> That'd be great. But realistically, I think we don't live long enough to be that lucky. <laughs> right. So does the dust only form in certain environments in space because of the temperature or say, does pressure have anything to do with it? Like what sort of conditions um, does it form under? Yeah, so it's a big factor is temperature and also just the density of molecules that you have. So, for example, the interstellar medium is never going to grow dust grains because there's just not enough out there to coagulate. Whereas around Red Giant, you've got just like massive stellar winds throwing out all kinds of rubbish and sticks together. So as as you said, your master's led better into your PhD. Why have you decided to do a project like the one that you're doing? I think I've always had a bit more of an interest in sort of the origins of life. And although this is not directly doing that, it's sort of, it's looking for the building blocks of life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, water is very crucial and we have a lot of it on Earth, but we don't really know why there's so many, so much on the terrestrial planets. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that looking for uh, the origin of this water in somewhere other than usually we look in carbonaceous chondrites. Mm-hmm. So the idea of looking somewhere elsewhere, like ordinary chondrites, I think it's quite an interesting challenge, mm-hmm. maybe. So you said you're looking for volatile elements within these chondrites. Um, So is that just going to be water or are you looking for other things as well? Uh, I think other things as well. I'm not entirely sure what yet though. So I know that I'm going to be looking at deuterium to hydrogen ratios. But I think that's going to be used as a tracer for water. So I'm not entirely sure what other volatiles as of yet. I guess I will find out when I start looking at the samples better. I suppose all of these things are relatively tricky to measure. So it's the kind of thing that develops as the project develops, in part at least. Yeah, so um, do you know what samples you're going to be working on yet? Yeah, I've got, I think at the moment, there are somewhere between 9 and 12. I can't remember the exact number, but they're unequilibrated ordinary chondrites. They're really tiny samples as well because some of them are from quite like big famous meteorites like Semakona and mm-hmm. Bishampur. So I've only got tiny little amounts of them. But I've already done some work on the SEM looking at them. So I think already you can see a bit of difference as you 
go through from the really the 3.0 type chondrites which have no kind of alter- alteration at all and then you go up to there's one which is like a 3.6 or 3.7 type and you can see already the effect that the thermal metamorphosis has had on the meteorite itself it already looks a lot harder to study actually is what I'm saying there's probably more interesting stuff but I do look at them and I'm like wow that one looks a lot more complicated Mm. yeah so I guess for a bit of background um chondrites I suppose can be assigned one of these numbers can't they so the scale goes from one to seven and three is sort of your pristine samples yeah and then moving towards seven is increasingly aqueously altered no thermally thermally or is it one to so three one is to alteration? one and two are aqueous alteration with one being most aqueously so they're altered. all your cm chondrites generally I guess. yeah and then, then moving up towards seven is thermally metamorphosed mm-hmm. okay so it's undergone heating while as part of an asteroid body okay so i'm guessing um yeah as you were saying that makes your samples a lot harder to interpret well mine are actually only type three but you get points so mine will be between like 3.0 and 3.8 that must be quite subjective assigning these points i think because when you're on that finer scale i think with that they use what's it called thermoluminescence right yeah so thermoluminescence is where you so as a as a body is heated, it can cause like thermal energy to be trapped in states inside the rock, whatever, and or the crystals, right? Yeah, so it forms crystals as it heats and then this causes energy to be trapped. And then if you shoot it with a no if, if you heat it, it releases this energy as photons. And then you can measure the photons to see how much energy was initially stored from the parent body heating. And this works very well for between like 3.0 and 4. That's really cool. Um, So I know in the time that you've been here at Manchester, you've had uh, some time on the scanning electron microscope. Um, So would you mind explaining a bit what that is and how you're going to be using it in your project? Okay, yeah, so it's basically, in a very simplified version, a really good microscope that uses electrons to look at very small details down to sort of the micron level. So I have thus far just been having a general look at my samples, seeing what they're made up of. So I also have done some EDS mapping, which basically just shows um, where you have specific elements throughout the sample. And I've been using them to try and try and locate some places for me to do further work on. So I'm looking specifically at the fine grained matrix within the sample surrounding um, like the larger grains or chondrules or things like that because it's quite porous and that's most likely where we're going to find the water. But because it's fine grained, it doesn't particularly look like anything. (laughs) So it's quite hard to say whether it's actually matrix or if it's something completely different. So that's where the EDS maps come in quite useful because you can assume that there will be for example pyroxene or olivine um in this fine grain matrix and you can have a look at the eds map and be like this roughly looks like it could be matrix and then you can zoom in and have a bit of a better look and hopefully once i've identified enough of that then i will be doing some mass spectrometry on them specifically to look for Volatiles. So basically, the reason that we can assume that there's going to be things like olivines in the fine grain matrix, because they are the common dust types. Or so, when you look at a red giant spectrum of the dust, it gives very similar characteristics 
to a spectrum of terrestrial olivine or pyroxene. So that's part of the reason why we think that these grains went on to form the matrix of the meteorites. That's very cool. It's come full circle very nicely then. (laughs) Um, So you're about six months into the project now. Sorry to freak you out by saying that. Um, (laughs) Four months. Sorry, four months into the project. Um, And how are you finding doing a PhD? Yeah, it's nice. It's fairly similar really to what I was doing last year because it was uh, a research master's. But it's also been quite difficult because Roman has been away. Ah, yes, he down was in Antarctica for well, two months. he was in Chile first mm. for ah, three weeks. Yes. Then he came back for a week. And he's now been in Antarctica since November without any way of emailing me. So, and then um, one of the SEMs that I was meant to be sort of poodling around with just to learn about what I was doing broke just after he left so it's been a bit slow I'd say Mm -hmm. because I've not had so much to do but it's been good to do lots of reading on the topic and I went to my first conference in January which was nice so yeah I think now Roman is back it should pick up the pace a little bit Mm. and I'm looking forward to doing some proper work. Yeah, so um, you were down in Oxford with us at the British Planetary Science Conference. Um, yes. Yeah, how did you find it? It was good. It, it was quite long. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what we all said. Yeah. yeah, it was an interesting one because... So it's not technically the first conference. I don't know. I, I've been to some daytime ones. But to go for a three-day conference where you had eight talks per two hour session Mm -hmm. and you had four sessions a day yeah it felt like you were listening for about 12 hours (laughs) which it was interesting a lot of the talks but um and I guess it's good to get a wide variety of different people speaking but I think it's also maybe more beneficial to go to a specific conference to what you work on yeah I guess it was just a very broad all of the British community Mm. in planetary science brought together at one so I know there are more specific ones I did mm. enjoy the instrumentation talks though there are some real sci-fi initiatives happening Mm. in the future which is pretty mad Mm. yeah and also obviously the fantastic (coughs) Manchester (coughs) sample science talks as well Oh, yes, they are best. <laughs> I, I wish we just had them on repeat for yeah. three days. That was smooth, guys. It was, Love it. it was nice to support my colleagues. Oh. There we go. Thanks, Helen. <laughs> you can That's throw that in there for your chart. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Um, well, a question that we like to ask all of our guests that we save to the end is um, if you could be doing something else um, other than looking at volatiles and chondrites, uh, what would you want to do? It can be in science or outside of science. I have no idea. I think if I could do anything, so this is always something I've discussed with people, that it's also a bit unfortunate that we're all quite smart people because I most of my friends are not very smart people. <laughs> <laughs> and so do they mind you saying that uh, they don't care okay no, I mean some of them didn't even finish secondary school and it's quite nice because they just get to travel the world do what they want you know work in bars occasionally and then move on to somewhere else and I think that's quite nice as an idea to not have a career plan so that then you know you're not disappointed if you don't get something and you don't tie yourself down to one place for a long mm. amount of and time. just getting to travel yeah so I think that would be nice but at the same time we are lucky because we live uh not we don't live we are also in a, like an academic field where you do get to travel so yeah yeah it could be worse <laughs> <laughs> and on that note <laughs> uh thanks everyone for listening at home and thank you very much Helen for coming on
uh, we're very excited to see uh, what more you do during your PhD and if you'd like to come on in a future episode to talk about your results that'd be fantastic okay thanks bye (laughs) (laughs) until next week thanks for listening bye bye